fact that a number of applicants who had done first and second year arts and UCD and all that, they weren't all just school leavers, right? right. So, yeah. And uh, I remember in the course of the interview, uh, they said to me at the end of the interview, and what will you do if you don't get this? And I said, I'll apply for it again next year, right? And they said, so you want it? And I said, I'm going to do this, right? And I think that. Yeah. And how long was the course? It was only a year at the time. So at 17, you'd qualify yeah. in journalism. Yeah. How was the course? Um, the course was very interesting. Uh, the courses would probably be better now, I think. What, yeah. what were the weaknesses then? The weaknesses were that you weren't really tied into newspapers, radio or television or anything like that, even though the three main, the four newspapers, the Irish Press was there at the time, uh, committed uh, to the course and all that, but you didn't have much of a connection with uh, newspapers. What do you so you learned English rather rather than how to write a news story, which is a completely different sort of thing. What, do you, what, do you, what did you take from, what do you remember from, do you remember any bigger insights or skills you learned from the Rabbin School? Um, it was always very useful afterwards to say you had shorthand 100 words a minute, which I'd say I had for about a month back to that level. <laughs> but you had a certificate that you could throw around, which was, which was important at that, at that time. I suppose it sort of broadened the mind and got me interested in current affairs in a way that I hadn't been into then, because I'd been rather discouraged at home. My father would always have said, you know, oh, girls shouldn't be interested in politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did the, you'd done the year and obviously you'd confirmed yourself you wanted to do something like journalism. Yeah. I mean, uh, so what happens next? What happened next then was um, the four main newspapers committed to take the first, the, sorry, the three Dublin papers made a commitment to take the first three in the class. I came first in the class, but that was really only academically. I mean, I was not suitable to be a journalist then. So I didn't. But you did come top of class. I did, yeah. But 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 um, so I didn't get a placement. So I went to the three news editors and said, "What do I do now? I really want to be a journalist. Will I now do a degree or what?" And they said, the three of them said, "Go off and get some regional experience." Now I've often thought later in my life, did I do the right thing or did the, did I do the wrong thing? But your everything turned out fine. Yeah, so, I did. I did an interview about the summer school uh, last week with the Munster Express. Yes. And they're very proud of the fact that they're you're a graduate of the Munster Express. Absolutely, I'm there. I'll be from the Kilkenny office. I was at the Kilkenny office for about uh, six months, uh, where the main thing I did was make tea. But I was able to. Were you good at it? Uh, <laughs> there was um, a senior reporter there, I think, who was afraid of his life that I was going to take his job. So. Um, but it, it enabled you sort of to say, well, I have six months' experience. Yeah, and, yeah. From, and from there? From there to the Corp Examiner. Examiner or Corp mm. Examiner. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Um, there was a job advertised and I got it. Yeah. And uh, generally reporting? General reporting, a great place uh, to start because you made your big mistakes outside of Dublin. Um, and <laughs> it was sort of, it was interesting because you were partners with a senior reporter. The one I was partnered with was a man called Larry Lyons, who was a very grandiose, cultured man. And he would take you everywhere with him at the beginning. But the way the examiner was, and it was wonderful, and it's the only way you really learn, is you'd be doing a big story one day, which might be on the front page, and you might be doing sort of an obituary the next day. But you got great, great experience. Uh, and how long did you stay at the examiner? About two years, and then... Um, then um, the Irish Times came looking for you. The Irish Times came looking for me, yeah. And how did that come about? Um, uh, there was a man called Donald Musgrave working for the Irish, uh, who was the cor correspondent of the Irish Times at the time, a very fine journalist. And he told Donald Foley, who was the very famous uh, news editor in, do in, do in the Irish Times, uh, that you should have a look at her lips or whatever. And so, so I was invited up to Dublin to meet Donald Foley. They, they'd write what you've written, presumably. Yeah, and as, as happened in those days and wouldn't happen now, uh, you met him in a pub, Bowes, across the road from the Irish Times. Uh, you had a cup of coffee and all that, and he says, well, could you start next Monday? Typically, yeah, yeah, and I said, well, no, I'd, I'd like to give a month's notice, you know, and do the decent thing and all that. Did, so you didn't hesitate? Oh, I didn't know. Why? Well, the Irish Times was the best newspaper. <laughs> What did they put you doing? Uh, general reporting at the start, right? And when this I started, was 70 this was 73. Three, okay. Yeah. Um, 
general not with earlier it was 72 general reporting at the start and what's interesting is at that time uh, there were a lot of uh, very well-known women in the Irish Times, but they were all doing feature writing rather than news. There were only two people doing news and current affairs, Rena Hollahan, who was then uh, Northern Editor, and myself. Right. Yeah. And, and you even worked late nights? They well, didn't encourage they, would, they wouldn't allow you to work at night because there was some sort of factories act where women couldn't work after midnight, and the paper didn't come out at four in the morning. And I was sort of keen that if I were going to be doing the same as the uh, male reporters, that I'd work the same hours as them and all that. So eventually, what, how, how this great principle was broken was that the man who was to do night editor, which was from nine to four in the morning, had a few drinks too much at lunch, uh, didn't turn up, and there was nobody to do it. And, and the then news editor said to me, well, there's your chance now if you want to do it. So there was no great principle involved, and I just took it. And what was the, the kind of the most unpleasant or uncomfortable story you were, or scene you were at in those days? Do you recall? Then you come to mind. The most uncomfortable thing was the Dublin and Monaghan bombings. Mm. Right? It, it would be imprinted in my mind forevermore. Um, at that particular day, a bomb went off. I was in the newsroom. Uh, a bomb went off in the Trinity College direction. And which were, extra, which were extra people as close to the Times. It was very close to the Irish Times. Yeah, and um, uh, a lot of male reporters were sent off out there. And I was going out as well. And the deputy news editor called me back and said, no, we can't. We shouldn't do this, right? But then a bomb went off in the other, the other direction, which was up around Talbot Street. So I just went myself, right? I sort of got there too early, I think. Do you understand? The fire brigade and these were, were just arriving. And I remember at that particular time, I used to wear a miniskirt and sort of boots up to my knees. They were my sort of trademark. And I got down, and there was a shoe shop there where, where, where the window had been broken in, and sh shoes were around the place and all that. And I went to go in there, and I went to move a pair of boots that were in the window, and there were a pair of legs and chopped off. It was terrible. And I remember getting the train. Uh, home on the the next day must have been Saturday, and I remember getting the train to go home, and I bought a cup of coffee, a plastic a paper cup of coffee, and I had all the papers on the table in front of me, and I was shaking so much I spilled a cup of coffee, and then got another one and spilled that as well, reading all the horror of it. Um, the at the time, as you said, there were a number of high-profile women writers in, in yes. the Irish Times, and many of them were both instrumental in and covered in detail, say the women's movement. Yes. change in social attitudes and change. Yes. You weren't part of that. I wasn't part of that because I was um, I was younger than them, right? But the groundbreaking work that they did at the time made it possible for people like me to progress through journalism. And it's amazing to think back of some of the things that they did and that, that we take for granted now. For example, in the woman's page in the Irish Times, one of them wrote a piece about how they couldn't open the bank account. They were single, they had a paycheck, a paycheck, you know what I mean? And a woman couldn't open the bank account without a man. And there were other sort of things like that, which are sort of un unthinkable nowadays. And um, many of them, I suppose, for want of a better word, were feminists. They were, yes. Are you a feminist? Um, I wouldn't say I'm a feminist, no. Why not? Um, because it had a particular sort of meaning for some at that time, that you had to be anti-men as well, right? Um, but I, I'd be for all for women's liberation. Um, uh, I, I would want, I have two daughters, I would want my two daughters, for example, I would, keep, I would say to them always, get yourself a job or a profession or whatever, uh, that you can look after yourself, that if you get into a bad marriage or anything like that, that money, that you'll be able to look after yourself and that money won't impede you from having your choice life, you know, your choice of partner and all that. So now you were off in Dublin, uh, writing stories, or by mm -hmm. during the Irish Times, you were cutting out a career at the yeah. very heart of, of news and current, uh, current affairs and politics. Mm -hmm. You said your dad had discouraged you. Mm -hmm. What did he make of all this back in, at home? In My father used to keep saying to me, um, he said, well, why couldn't you be like the other women and write features? <laughs> <laughs> and you had three younger sisters. I had three younger sisters. And what did they make of it? Um, Were you their hero? Uh, there would be sort of tensions in families, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you had gone off to Dublin before. I have gone out, I have gone out, yeah. yeah. Uh, my next sister was a graphic artist in the Examiner, 
and then me was a nurse, and then Angela uh, did science in Galway. How did your mum make it? Uh, my mum was very pleased, very proud of you. Did she tell you? Yeah, yeah. She lived until um, 1994. My father died when I was 25 in 1977. When you were young? Yeah. You, in Dublin, you gravitated gradually towards kind of political kind of stories when you were I did. I began to see at that particular time um, that everything that happened in the country sort of went through and was processed through uh, the whole area. And you could be writing about culture one day, agriculture another day, party politics another day. In other words, there were different, there was great variety in it as well. And also it was where the power was. So for that reason, I sort of... But there were no, I mean, in, in all of the history of Irish politics up to then, yeah. there been a small number of women in politics. Yeah. But there appears to be no women covering politics. No. You were the first woman covering yeah. politics. Yeah. Uh, what was that like? Um, it was interesting, probably, um, it was, uh, the, the attitude towards you was sort of quite interesting on time. I remember the first day that I arrived on the Oireachtas Press Gallery. Um, it was just after Liam Cosgrave's coalition with Brendan Corrish in 1973. And Paddy Donegan was a Minister for Defence. He's now dead. And I remember coming up to an old uh, seasoned reporter, Ned Murphy, afterwards, and saying to Ned Murphy, who was the bird, right? <laughs> and then Murphy said, oh, well, that's right, and all that. You think that was a compliment? No, I said to Ned then, and, and, I, and, I, and I said, and who's your man? He said, how dare you speak of a minister like that? <laughs> <laughs> because all the ministers were men, I think, that they were, time, weren't they? They were, they were, yeah. And most of the TDs were men. They were, yeah. Um, and did you, did, I mean, did you cover politics differently because you were a woman? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. No, I, I, I don't think so. No. I mean, the coverage of politics was changing an awful lot from the 1970s onwards. And I went back and sort of studied all this. For example, you had a man called uh, Michael McInerney, who was political correspondent of the Irish Times, in the 60s, certainly, if not in the 50s. I don't know how long he was doing, but he was there in the 60s. And I went back looking at sort of how he would cover the mass and things like that. And there was terribly straight reportage, right? Whereas I think the man who changed the coverage of politics uh, in a good way for citizens was John Healy in his heyday, right? He used to do a political column in the Irish Times and what was very interesting about the column in the early days of it was that he was explaining to readers why things were happening and going behind the scenes about the relationships between ministers and people, about so-and-so was promoted because geographically you have to give something to the West. Or, you know, the, it began to be a far more intimate sort of thing than it had been. And it informed people much more, so they've been much better. I don't know whether we intended this or not, but